Hi, so I want to try to make a PowerPoint and um, actually I already have, it's taken hours, but I wanted to show you how to see all of these flow charts in black and white and then apply it to an example. I'm not sure if the video is going to be worth doing all of that together without any breaks. And I can't assure myself that you guys will necessarily take the breaks that you need to, to give yourself the mental rests. So um, let me see what I can do. This might be one video, this might be two videos. <laughs> so here goes and i'm going to go ahead and turn my video off because you don't need to see me while i'm talking i've already made the animation the animation strokes so i'll just i'll have this discussion you won't see me but just know that i'm here on the sidelines trying to help you so what i meant when i said that i want to put it all in black and white is that i'm going to try to make it clear so i've taken the flow chart in grayscale and we're going to look at a few segments or one segment of the flow chart at a time give an explanation of what's going on there, and then we're going to apply all this to a specific example. In class, we've worked a lot on the first three steps, and these are essentially the, the most vital steps. That's identifying the claim, and that means writing the claim that's written in English in symbolic form using the correct parameter to do that. Then writing the symbolic form of what would be true when that's false. In other words, writing the symbolic logical inverse. Then identify which of those two statements is the null and which is the alternative. With more practice, you'll really come to understand how to put things into autopilot and not necessarily follow a flowchart rigidly, but try to understand these first three steps better. The better you understand them, the more the logic will start to become part of your natural thinking, and you might even call it common sense at that point. So there are different paths you can take if you're doing a real study versus answering a homework question, and I'll try to identify those in a moment. But basically, you want this to become intuitive. Step four is to select the significance level. We'll denote that by alpha. That's pretty common notation for it. This is the probability of making a type one error. So what's the chance of rejecting the null when it's true? Since it's gonna be based off of the seriousness of a type one error, Alpha will commonly be chosen to be 5% or 1%. And I'll go into that a little bit more later, but what's important to note here is you can use different levels of significance, but the level of significance that you use needs to be chosen in advance of gathering the statistics, running the sample statistics and determining the test statistic, and then running the whole method, you know, finishing the hypothesis test. We do not choose the level of significance after we've done all that. That would be unethical, even if done ignorantly. So whether out of ignorance, intentional or not, we must remember, choose the level of significance in advance and then run the test. Now I'll tell you that your homework is gonna give you those numbers. So if that's making you stressed out at all, just relax, you're gonna be told. But in an actual study that you would do, you should be aware. And if anyone else is doing it, you should be questioning whether or not they chose the number after. All right, step five is identify the test statistic that will be um, based off of what you're testing, basically what parameter you're testing. There's a um, set distribution for each parameter. Some of the ones we already know is the normal distribution or the standard normal distribution, Z, the student T distribution, and the chi-square. We'll get into those when they're applicable. Today, we're only going to see one example, so we can't see all of them. Next is step six. Step six is to find the test statistic. In either method you're using, whether it's p-value or critical value, you're going to need to find the test statistic. So this is definitely flashcard worthy. And if you're allowed to have a note card during your test, like I allow, you're going to want to have this on there. Which distribution are you going to use? Well, it depends on which test you're doing. If you're doing a um, one population proportion test, you're going to be using the Z distribution, the normal distribution, standardized. If you're going to be doing a mean test to test about the average from a population, single population still, and sigma is known, well, then you use Z still, the standard normal distribution. But if sigma is not known, then you're going to use the T distribution, the student T distribution. And then we can say more about variance and standard deviation later with the chi-square distribution. But in any case, you'll notice that these test statistics are a standardization of what kind of uh, distribution statistic we have. So we'll make more sense of that as we run through our example. But far before we get to our example, 
I want to make sure you understand that if you're testing the mean, so this is only for the case of testing the mean, as you make inferences about it, you're going to choose between Z and T with this thought process. Use the T distribution or student T distribution if sigma is not known. Now, there's a little bit more nuance than that, but let me just say if sigma is not known and the original parent distribution is normally distributed, then you can go forward with T. If sigma is not known and maybe the normal distribution isn't applied to the parent, but your sample size is greater than 30, then you can use T. You use Z if sigma is if sigma is known and if the parent is normally distributed or if the sample size is greater than 30 you're still in that boat using the z standard normal distribution if sigma is known what if the parent distribution was not normal or you didn't know it was and you weren't allowing yourself to assume that it was which is what most of the homework makes us do if you weren't willing to assume that the parent distribution was normal and your sample size was less than 30 then you'd have to use non-parametric or boot bootstrapping methods, and we're not getting into that here. So it's essentially going to boil down to when you're testing the mean, you're going to use the student t-distribution or the standard z-normal distribution. So step six leads you to two different options, and I'm actually going to take you through the critical value method first. So the critical value method begins the same as the other method. You need to find the test statistic first. Now, the way it's a little different is that you have to find the critical values or critical value by determining how much area our significance level will consume on either the left or the right or split up into two tails. I'll explain a little bit more about this later. But the critical region is also known as the rejection region. And what we try to do is find out, is the test statistic more extreme than our critical value or values? depending on which way you're going, of course. So we're, we're basically looking at the number line of the distribution, and you can look at that with GeoGebra. You can find out those number line values or those uh, critical numbers with the Libre text, or you can use the distribution tool with the TI-83 calculator. But again, step set seven, and I'm putting six and seven together, is to try and see if the test statistic is at least as extreme or more extreme than the critical value and that means that we reject null if that happens we fail to reject the null if the test statistic is not as extreme as the critical value or values this will look a lot better with a picture but more on that later for now let's just keep moving through the flow chart and spelling this out in black and white a more common um, approach that people use especially now that we have software is the p-value method it's so common people make memes about it, people make t-shirts about it, and it'll say something like, if the p is low, reject the, that should say null, not ho. Anyway, if the p is low, reject the null. If the p is high, let the null fly. We're going to make sense of that a little bit later. So like I said, we find the test statistic, and then we find the p-value. Now, I'll show you the flow chart to find the p-value in a second, but essentially the p-value is Assuming that the null is true, you set up your distribution, and then you try to find out the area that's captured or the area that's bounded by the test statistic. So not by alpha, not by the level of the test or the significance level, but instead the test statistic. Again, you can look at the distribution through GeoGebra. You can use the, the Libre text calculators. Or you can actually run the entire test in the TI-83. Well, you can run the entire test in each of those as well. But you run the entire test, and one way or another, you'll be able to calculate the p-value. So once you have the p-value, you make the decision. This is usually called the decision criterion, or the initial decision before you actually conclude in plain English. You decide to reject the null if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. You fail to reject the null if the p-value is greater than alpha. This flowchart helps you to visualize how to find the p-values. You're either going to have a left-tailed or a right-tailed or a two-tailed test. And it's going to be left-tailed if your alternative statement was a strict less than. It'll be right-tailed if your alternative inequality was a strict greater than. And it's a two-tailed if you have the less than or greater than or both situation. In other words, not equals. So what type of test are you using? Follow the flowchart to decide how you're going to find the p-value. In essence, where does the test statistic lie 
and based on your test direction, find out the area that's more extreme in that direction. An example will make more sense of this as well. Finally, the last part. Now you know whether or not you're going to reject or fail to reject the null, and that's great. But how did that relate to your original question? Was the original claim containing the condition of equality? Was the original claim not containing the condition of equality? In other words, sometimes the original claim has the null, and sometimes it's the alternative. And so to say that you're going to reject the null means one thing versus fail to reject the null. In other words, we've got to translate back from the math to the English or plain English. So step eight is to restate the decision in non-technical terms. And there's a flow chart for that. In fact, I have a flow chart and a matrix and just a table of statements to follow. But if you were to use the flow chart, you start here and you say, does the original claim contain the condition of equality? If it did, then when rejecting the null, you're also rejecting the original claim. This is the only case in which the original claim is rejected. If the original claim did not contain the condition of equality, like maybe it was a strictly greater than statement or strictly less than or strictly not equal, if that's the case, then if you reject the null, you're actually providing support to the alternative and the alternative is the claim. So this is the only case in which the original claim is supported. Those are two key results. And then there's the other cases. We'll get into this in our own examples later, but hopefully you can uh, either make the, uh, your own table or find a good way to memorize this flow chart. I know what you're thinking. It still doesn't make sense. Can we see a specific example? Yeah, we will. So here's one that comes from the homework. It says a news article that you read stated 60% of voters prefer the Democratic candidate. You think that the actual percent is smaller. 152 of the 293 voters that you surveyed said they prefer the Democratic candidate. What can be concluded at the 1% significance level or level of significance? So you want to read through this carefully and you notice that it said 60% of voters. That starts to indicate to you right away that your parameter is going to be a proportion. So we're testing P or pi if we use that notation. And what we're trying to determine is, is the actual percentage smaller as we think? Again, when we say that we're testing a claim, it might not actually be stated in those words, I claim that, whatever, but it can be implied that there is some sort of a testable argument or testable thought. And that's what we call the claim. So our original claim is based off of this percent being smaller. Now let's do steps one and two. You may need to read and reread the problem. You're again looking at the fact that an article presented that 60% of voters prefer some Democratic candidate. All right, I don't know if it's that's true or not. And in this case, our homework is asking us to think that it's not true, that it's actually a smaller percentage of people that favor this candidate. So step one is going to be identify the claim and write it symbolically. In other words, P is going to be less than 0.6, or your population proportion is less than 60%. The smaller is what indicates that, and the benchmark is that 60%. That's the original claim. You might want to write that down. You should try to remember that. Next part is to write what would be true if that was false. In other words, the logical inverse to that statement. So if you're not smaller than, you're gonna be greater than or equal to. And it's not just the greater than or equal to part that we care about. This means it's basically at least 60%. It's the equal part. That's where we get our null statement from. Step three. After translating those English statements into these math symbolic statements, we've got to put a label of null or alternative on it. And in the homework, these are just drop downs you get to choose, but it's pretty straightforward. You're going to use the value 60% as your benchmark number, and then you're going to say, well, what are you testing? We're testing proportion. Now, I'm actually looking at the alternative first, because in my situation, 
It's the alternative that appeared first as I was reading. But the null and alternative need to be well understood. So go back and review this as you do the homework over and over. The alternative is the one that has the strict inequality. The null is the one that contains the equality. It looks like this in the flowchart. So the alternative again is the one that has the strict inequality. I like to think of it as like an, an upside down V that it's gonna fall either left or right, which means it's gonna be either a less than or a greater than or both less than or greater than, which is the not equals. So ours ended up being a less than, meaning that we're gonna have a left tailed test. Our rejection region is gonna be on the left. And because they told us that our significance level was 1%, we're gonna have a 1% critical region. That's our rejection region. So we have a left tailed test. Again, that's, that's determined by the alternative hypothesis. Now the null hypothesis is the easier one to find and usually gets labeled at the top of the list when they're asking for alternative and null. It doesn't matter which one comes up first in your reading. It's usually that they put the null on top and that's because null is just finding where it's equal. I look, I, I look at the last two L's of the word null and I kind of just like let that fall to the side and it becomes an equal sign. So RP equaling 60% is our benchmark number we run with in the test. Now there's other notation that they'll use. You might sometimes see them merge the H sub zero with P and make it P sub zero or H sub one with P and make it P sub one. Don't get put off by that. It's just another way to consolidate your symbols there. All right, for this study, we should do what? What's our test? What's our distribution? Well, we already know it's a test about the population proportion. So you're given a couple options here in the homework, and it's pretty straightforward. You're going to test a population proportion, but why are we using Z? Well, that's because we always use Z because the standardized score for the test statistic is going to be z equals p hat minus mu sub p hat divided by sigma sub p hat. If you don't remember those, you might want to return back to the central limit theorem or just believe me that I'm right. So we're going to use the z distribution. It's given away there. This is one of the things you should definitely be putting on your test card or your note card if you haven't already. <clears throat> in other words, you might see notation in your homework that will say p sub zero is equal to and then that's our number 60% or 0.6. And we plug it all in. Okay, let's slow down a little bit because we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So we know now that we're doing a test about population proportion because there was a statement made about the percentage of, can of people that will support some Democratic candidate. We also know that we're going to be doing a left-tailed test of proportion because our alternative statement was being less than 60%. And we know that we'll be using a Z distribution because that's the distribution that's associated with a proportion test. But steps four and five are first, select the significance level. Now I kind of wave over that in my head because I already know that I'm supposed to do this in a real study based off of the seriousness of a type one error but these are homework problems. It's not, they're not real studies, okay? In real studies, you'll commonly use an alpha of 5%. And if it's not stated in the homework, you would use 5%. Or if on the test, I give you a problem and I don't state the level of the test, then you can presume it's 5%. In our situation, we were lucky enough to have them tell us that they want this to be a 1% test. So that tells us the level of significance is 1% and that our critical region that will be cut off will be 1% and we can find the corresponding critical value in a minute. Okay, but we want to identify the test statistic, the actual number. I know I was just talking about it, but let's calculate that value now. All right, so in the homework, when they want to know the standardized score, they'll say, what's the test statistic? And they'll give you a drop down. It's only going to give you T or Z because we're not doing any uh, tests for variance or standard deviation. So it's either tests for proportion or mean. Now, if it's proportion, it's always Z. So that's kind of a gimme for our problem. You're not gonna use T for proportion, but 
if it was mean, you would have to think a little bit about, you know, what we talked about earlier. Here's the test statistic calculation. I like to denote them by TS, so I remember which z-score I'm talking about. You don't have to do that, but that's a recommendation. In the problem, they told us that 152 of the 293 voters were surveyed and blah, 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 you know? So we got that information, which is called the sample statistic, okay? That's the sample statistic. 152 divided by 293, that's not the test statistic, by the way. This entire calculation is the test statistic. That p hat is just your sample proportion of success. What's our, what's our population proportion of success? We don't know. We're actually applying the central limit theorem, which underlines everything we're doing here, to assume that the null is equal to the center of the distribution of sample proportions when you have size 293. So this is what we're using as that 60 or 0.6. Let me just show you all the numbers here. So you're gonna find the test statistic by taking the p hat minus the p or assumed p. That's what we're doing. We are running this whole test by assuming that p is 60%. This number turns out to be something close to like 58 or 51%, 52%. So it's gonna be a negative value altogether. You can see that coming. But we already knew that because we're running a left tailed test since our alternative statement was a less than statement. So let's actually calculate this, but this is about 0.52 minus 0.6 and then all this other stuff. Just be careful plugging it all in. Our test statistic turned out to be negative 2.838164 and we'll just round that to negative 0.838, negative 2.838 because the homework asks for a three decimal approximation. All right, so here's how this would look. You don't have to write this out, but it's kind of helpful, especially because I wanna look at both the critical value method and the p-value method. So you, in each case, need to know where the test statistic is. If you were to visualize it, it'd be somewhere over here on the left because it's negative, right? Now in the p-value method, we're gonna to wanna to actually find out how much area is bounded by that test statistic. That's called the p-value. Again, the p-value is the chance that if the null was true, if this was actually equal to 60%, and you had a sample of the same size, 293, that you would have a new sample that would be at least that likely. We'll get into that at the end. For now, I'll just use the critical value method. We'll do the p-value method next. With the critical value method, you want to look at the number line. You want to compare the critical value and the test statistic. You can use GeoGebra or some other tool, but you can draw out and look at those two things. So we already were looking at the test statistic, turning out to be approximately negative 2.84, which bounds this region. Don't think about the area right now, focus on the number line. So the significance level is 1%, and we need to find out where is the critical value when you have 1% left area? I'm gonna use the table actually. I'm not even gonna use GeoGebra right now. So I want to, want to show you how um, straightforward this can be. You're gonna imagine, what if there was 1% left area in a Z distribution? And by left area, I mean it would be over here. It might be hard for you right now to visualize how much is 1%, which GeoGebra can help you with that. But I'm gonna use the table for now so I can focus on just the number line. All right, so. Here's the uh, table A-2, it's the standard Z normal distribution and they only give us area from the left. We're looking for 1%, which turns out to be pretty close to 0 .09, 0099. It's not exactly 1%, but it's as close as we're gonna get. And that corresponds to a Z-score of negative 2.33. Remember, we are trying to find left area, so this table is perfect for us on this problem where we are doing a left-tailed test, not as opposed to later problems, where you might be doing a two-tailed or, or a right-tailed, which you have to change things a little bit, change your approach, I should say. Anyways, our z-score then is gonna be negative 2.33. When I say our z-score, I mean our critical value z-score, okay? Because we've already got a z-score out there. That's the test statistic z-score. That's based off the stat information. This one is based off of having a 
1% rejection region in the left side for this problem. So in order to make our decision, we actually have to compare the two. Step seven is reject the null if the test statistic is in the critical region, fail to reject the null if the test statistic is not in the critical region. Well then let's visualize this. We've got the test statistic turning out to be negative 2.84-ish, remember? And I was looking at that earlier. <clears throat> the critical value ended up being negative 2.3263 if I use GeoGebra, or if I use my table, it's negative 2.33. So the critical value method is actually further to the inside of the curve. That means our 1% rejection region makes up this space, and that means that our test statistic is falling within the critical region. Yikes. So we are going to reject the test statistic. All right. What about the other 99%? Um, this is the fail to reject region. So this is why we call the critical region the rejection region, because if the test statistic falls in it, we reject the null. All right. Now, so reject the population proportion, re reject that the population proportion is 60%. That's the, the null claim or the null statement and support the alternative. So we're kind of done with the test here once you start to really understand, but I'm gonna go on so you can see how the p-value method would work. But you're kind of done because if you support the alternative, that's H1, but the alternative was the claim, then you know what you're supporting. Anyways, let's move on. All right, so now we're gonna make a decision with the p-value method. The rest of it looks pretty much the same, you know, in terms of you're looking at the number line, but now your focus is gonna be on the area. And I'm going to find the p-value by calculating the amount of area that is more extreme than our test statistic. And extreme in our direction for this test is left extreme. So it's how much area is further to the left of the test statistic. So we make our decision to reject the null if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. Again, the p-value is the amount of area that is more extreme than our test statistic. So in this case, we're, do, we're going left. We fail to reject the null if the p-value is greater than alpha. Remember that shirt? If the p is low, the uh, <clears throat> null must go. There's a quick way to remember both of these. If the p is low, the null must go. If the P is high, the null can fly. So you reject the null if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. You fail to reject the null if the p-value is greater than alpha. I'm not really a fan of this, but it's a memory mnemonic that a lot of people use, so I'm gonna give it to you. All right, our p-value compared to our alpha was 0 0.0023 compared to 0 0.01. And then since it's less than or equal, means that you're going to reject the null. We know we're going to reject the null. Let's see how the homework asks you for those answers. They want you to just fill them in. Part D is put in the p-value. They want it in standard decimal form, but we know that that would be 0.23% or 23 hundredths of 1%. Keep that in mind for later when we restate some conclusions. The p-value. Well, the p-value, obviously, since uh, we've got a 0 0.0023 compared to a 0 0.01, we would say that that is less than or equal. You only get those two choices. We're not dividing it up into three choices. It's either less than or equal, which means it's in the region, the, the test statistic fell in the critical region, or we say greater than, which means that it didn't. All right. So based off of this, we should reject the null hypothesis. I get it. I pretty much just said that four times over. But now you're seeing how it would be input into your homework if you're actually inputting the homework. All right, now the final wording then. Because it's one thing to have all that stuff in symbols and numbers, but where's the non-technical wording come into play here? Here's a flowchart that will help you with that. <clears throat> Because our p-value 
was less than our alpha when we're rejecting the null, we have to rewind our thoughts back to the original claim. The original claim was that the p, not p value, the p meaning population proportion was smaller than 60%. That was given in the original homework problem. So you start the flowchart by asking yourself, does the original claim contain the condition of equality? Yes or no? No, the original claim was a strict less than. So in this case, no. All right, so then did we reject the null? Yes, I've said that like five times now. <laughs> and so if you reject the null, you are gonna say that there is sufficient sample evidence to support the claim. The claim that, and you gotta put your own English words into that, that the proportion, the true population proportion of people who support this democratic, can, democratic candidate is less than 60%. Your homework will give it to you in A, B, C, D, or um, multiple choice options. Pause at any time and rewind if this is going too fast, okay? So in your homework, they'll give you this. <clears throat> the data suggests the population proportion is significantly smaller than 60%. We're showing support when we say that. At the 1% level, that was the level of our significance for the test. So there is sufficient evidence. Pay clo close attention to each of these phrases. So it's a statement about the population proportion p which is what we we're testing it's saying that it's significantly smaller meaning that we are we have found that we support that that claim to sufficiently uh, that there is sufficient evidence to conclude the proportion of voters who prefer the democratic candidate is smaller than 60 percent it's almost redundant after that first part of the sentence but here's our sentence you can compare that to the ones that are wrong so this one says the data suggests the population proportion is not significantly smaller than 60%. Well, that's not true. We just did the flow chart and we, we thought this through. And so it's saying, then if it's not significantly evidence, why is there sufficient evidence to conclude that it's equal to 60%? Well, because that would mean that they were supporting the null, but, but we're not. In fact, we never accept the null. We either reject or fail to reject the null. That's another story. The data suggests the population proportion is not significantly smaller than 60%. Well, again, that's not true. So I just stopped on both of those and I went with the right answer. The homework might stop you right there and have you conclude with just the final wording in plain English, but it might take you a little bit further and ask you to interpret the p-value. So if you're asked to interpret the p-value, Here's the way you think about that. P-value is the uh, percent chance that if you took another sample of the same size, when the null is true, that that sample would be at least as extreme as our sample. And for us, at least as extreme means left direction, less than side. So the answer on this one is gonna be, um, in, in the context of, of our question, is gonna be that if the population proportion of voters who prefer the Democratic candidate is 60%, so they just, that whole first part is just saying if the null is true. So if the population proportion of voters who prefer the Democratic candidate is 60%, if the null is true, okay? And if another sample of 293 voters are surveyed, so again, if you take a sample of the same size, everything there needs to be, if, if that's not being stated, there's no way this could be the right answer to interpret p-value. That's why I immediately ignore the first one and the last one. They're not even saying enough to get this out there. I'll explain why the second one's wrong in a minute. There would be a 0.23. Remember how our p-value was 0 0.0023 in standard form? Well, this is just being put in percentage form. So it's 23 hundredths of 1% chance that fewer than 52%. Now, why'd they say fewer than? because that's the extreme in our direction, less than. So this is at least as extreme as our sample, and that, that's our sample number, p hat. 152 over 293 was about 52% of that new sample of 293 preferring the Democratic candidate. So the p-value might take a little bit of time to understand, <laughs> but watch this exact, 
two minute comment that I made over and over. I think it will put it together for you, honestly. Um, so why wasn't this one right? It started by saying, if the sample proportion of voters who prefer the Democratic candidate is 52%, that's why it's wrong right there. It's not beginning by assuming the null is true. And you have to begin by assuming the null is true. And this is saying if the sample proportion, not population. So that's not a statement about the null because the null is always a parameter statement, population statement. This is the sample proportion. And then they didn't say is equal to 60%, which was the null. They're saying is equal to 52%, which is the p hat. So the reason why this one's wrong is because it's not, it's not initiating the statement correctly. You should be initiating the statement by saying, if the population proportion is true, you know, like if in our case, population proportion is equal to 60%. And if another sample is taken of 293, then we are going to expect these things to happen at, at the p value rate, by the way. And make sure that you understand that that's where the p value comes in when you're interpreting. It's because it's happening at that rate. All right, how about this? Some of the homework problems will take you one step further and they'll say interpret the significance level as well, which remember the significance level was our alpha. So in the context of this problem, we're gonna look for one that starts by assuming the null is true and then falsely rejects it. Because interpreting the significance level means interpret the probability of rejecting a true null. In other words, it's, the measurement of chance that if the null is true and you reject it, you know, you, you've had an error. So if the population proportion of voters who prefer the Democratic candidate is 60%. So you've got the null statement properly worded. That's why I'm choosing this one. I mean, that's why I initially start reading this one. See, this one says if the proportion of voters who prefer the Democratic is smaller than 60%, so it could have been referring to the population proportion. They didn't have to say the word. In fact, if they don't, I assume they're talking about the general population proportion. So I wasn't going to, um, I wasn't going to knock it down because of that. But then it, it went on to say is smaller than, and that's not, that's not beginning with the null assumption. And th these are just too small. They're not making sense of what we're saying. So let me read on. And if another sample is taken, of the same size, there would be a alpha chance. So a 1%, that was the level of our test given in the original homework statement, that we would end up falsely concluding the population proportion of, view, of Democratic candidate, of voters who prefer the Democratic candidate is smaller than 60%. So this is saying, if the null is true, you take another sample, there would be a 1% alpha percent chance of rejecting it. Because if you support the alternative, you're in essence rejecting the null. I can't assume that you're going to make perfect sense of this in one example here. But if you watch it over and over, if you read the text, if you follow along in class, this can all come together for you, I promise. There are still some deeper concepts like the type 1 and type 2 errors that for me took a while to really understand. and. Um, seeing a chart was helpful and hearing it over and over again was good, but it wasn't until I started teaching it that I felt like I really understood. So here's a chart you might want to use. And this is all bonus time right now. If you don't want to watch, you can cut it off. We finished that homework problem. Um, I'll show you uh, my final answer with me putting it in. But in any case, actually, I won't. You don't need to see that. In any case, here's the type 1 and type 2 errors. So you're going to run your test and it's going to be based off of some sample statistic. And then you get your conclusion, your initial decision to reject or fail to reject that should not say accept. And, and there, and then, so that, that means that if the null is true, these kinds of things can happen. If the null is true, your test could result in rejecting it. Well, that would mean you rejected a true null and that would be that type one error they again had some bad notation there. They should say probability of a type one error is equal to alpha, not a type one error is equal to alpha, but I don't know who made this. I just grabbed it off the web <laughs> really fast. Um, anyways, the probability, so the proper notation here is P of type one error is equal to alpha. And for us, that was a 1% level.
but whatever it is, generically speaking, if the null is true and you reject it, you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't have rejected it because it was true. And so you're, you're causing an error. The other uh, side of that token is if you accept, and you shouldn't say accept, you should just say fail to reject. If you fail to reject the null when it was false, that's another error. So in any case, and, and this, the probability of a type two error is called beta. We can get into that more later. Um, I found this kind of meme on the web here, reject or fail to reject. There is no accept. I want you to remember that they shouldn't have said accept. Okay, that was a little typo that they had apparently. In fact, speaking of memes, I hope that this whole thing helped. <laughs> I don't know if it helped. You'll see lots of memes out there like roses are red, violets are blue. If you were a null hypothesis, I would fail to reject you. And if you get what's going on, that actually is a little bit funny. It's partially entertaining. Um, maybe this is a meme that you can kind of connect with. Don't know what a p-value is. And at this point, I'm too afraid to ask. <laughs> Please don't fall into that boat, okay? If you do, I don't know what to tell you because you're in control of your own emotions and everything. But I really encourage you. You've got the Ace Lab tutors. You've got me. You've got the entire uh, uh, internet, right? The World Wide Web. In fact, um, I want to say thanks for following along and sticking with this. But I did, in my work, I found this tutorial. These are live links. You can click on them if you're looking at the PowerPoint right now. Uh, or you can type those in. But this tutorial on p-value was really good, um, done, done really well. So I'll say goodbye, and um, I'll see you in class. I hope this helps a lot.